So, uh, welcome everybody. This is uh, uh, our third uh, number theory talk for a public audience um, organized by the number theory unit at CAMS. Um, today, uh, we are very happy to present a very distinguished uh, mathematician in number theory, Professor Michel Waldschmidt from uh, University of Paris, Sorbonne. Um, he has had a, a long and distinguished career, including, among other topics, so being president of the Mathematical Society of France, the Société Mathématique de France. So, and um, Professor Waldschmidt has also, uh, has also uh, been involved for a number of years in promoting mathematics worldwide. He's been to Beirut uh, some 20 years ago. That was the first time I met him. Um, and it is uh, such a pleasure to have you uh, as our speaker today. So the title of Professor Waldschmidt's talk is Transcendental Number Theory, Recent Results and Open Problems. And so uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, thanks again. Thank you very much for this introduction. It's kind of you. And Thank you for the invitation to speak to this uh, seminar. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to speak of my favorite topic, which is uh, transcendental number theory. And uh, in your introduction, you pointed out that I am from Sorbonne University. I found yesterday the poster of the, uh, of the seminar where it is written that I am from the University of Nancy. Oh, goodness. But, okay, we will correct that, yeah. of course. But uh, I, I studied in Nancy, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in 10 days, I go to give another lecture on a quite different topic in uh, Nancy. <laughs> it's oh, not my, my apologies. We will, <laughs> we will put up a corrected version on the archived web page, goodness. Um, okay, thank you. So um, I, I would like to try to give my talk on my Blackboard. I am at home, and I have a nice Blackboard, but... Uh, I hope that it is okay for you. Uh, if it is not okay, I have a file, which uh, by the way is on my website. So you can download my file and uh, see some presentation. Th the one which I plan to give on the Blackboard is slightly different. Uh, we do not say exactly the same thing uh, when we speak on the Blackboard or when we show some slides. I prefer the Blackboard because uh, it's more creative. We, we create the mathematics that uh, we, we explain. So you will tell me whether uh, you can see it. And just uh, to, to start with, I, I will write a few things. And you will tell me if uh, there is some, so, something which is not worthwhile. So we uh, will consider the set of uh, non-negative integers. So this is 0, 1, 2, and so on. Is it uh, readable? Can you see uh, that? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. For me, it is readable. Um, also, may I point out to the audience that uh, Professor Waldschmidt uh, asked, if you have a question, uh, just unmute yourselves and ask the question. It's perfectly fine. So the talk itself will be 60 minutes and we have time for questions afterwards as well. Great. I will mute myself too, so as not to create feedback loops and such. Yes, I, I will be very pleased to, to have some questions because it means that uh, at least uh, the one who has question is uh, listening to, to what I am saying. So, uh, I, I, as you see, I, I include zero in N because I am French and uh, in France, uh, zero is, uh, is an element of this set of uh, natural numbers. And then uh, we have the uh, integers, Z, which are plus or minus uh, the non-negative integers. Uh, we have the rational numbers, Q. And uh, when we con continue to construct uh, the uh, fields, uh, the next one is a field of uh, real numbers, uh, which is a subset of C. The, the one which I am interested in is the set of complex numbers, which are algebraic over Q. So the algebraic numbers, I do them by Q bar. Q bar is the set of uh, complex numbers, which satisfy a polynomial equation with coefficients in Q. And so, uh, Q bar is a set of algebraic numbers. And C minus Q bar is a set of transcendental numbers. Uh, it's uh, 
remark which was uh, done by uh, Shimura several times. He, he wrote it to me, he wrote it to uh, Daniel Bertrand. He said, why are there so many people trying to prove that some numbers are transcendental? It is much more interesting to prove that some numbers are algebraic. Of course, not, not the same. And he's right. Uh, Shimura proved the algebraicity of uh, many uh, very interesting numbers. And if you prove that the number is algebraic, then uh, you may have a lot of information. Uh, you have some structure, you have a, a number field, you have the class number, you have, you have many things. If you prove that the number is transcendental, it is more or less the end of the story. Uh, you say that uh, we can say it's a number like almost all numbers, and it's not so interesting. Nevertheless, uh, it's important to de decide whether a number, a given number is algebraic or not. And uh, it is a problem which is known to be very difficult. But even to prove that some given numbers are irrational, which means that they are not uh, in queue, is also a very difficult problem. And uh, I will mention some uh, conjectures in this direction. It is something which may be a little bit surprising that it is so difficult to prove that the number is irrational, say. Uh, we have some criterion for irrationality. For example, if you have the decimal expansion of the binary expansion of a number, you know that it is uh, rational if and only if this expansion is ultimately periodic. And if you have the continued fraction expansion, you know that the number is, uh, if the number is rational, this continued fraction expansion is finite and conversely. But for the interesting numbers, which means that for the numbers which come from, arise from analysis, an analysis uh, most often we can say almost always we have no clue, no idea of the decimal expansion, of the binary expansion, or of the continued fraction. There are a few exceptions, like the number e, the basis of the exponential. We know the, con the continued fraction, and this is uh, proved by Euler that it is irrational. But uh, most often, we have no information of this uh, sort, and therefore, we need to find some other device to prove that uh, some numbers are uh, irrational and uh, better to prove that some numbers are transcendental. The name uh, transcendental was coined by Leibniz in uh, 1684, say in the 17th century. Uh, Leibniz uh, studied the philosophy, mathematics, and uh, introduced the name transcendental in philosophy and in mathematics. But uh, of course, the two meanings are, are quite different. Sometimes I receive some uh, uh, messages of people who say that I have been interested in the transcendence in philosophy, and then I would like to learn the transcendental numbers. Well, why not? But uh, this is something completely different. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, at the time of Leibniz, the, the definition of an algebraic number was not very clear. Even when Liouville proved the first existence of algebraic numbers, he, of transcendental numbers, excuse me, uh, he did not say, I construct some numbers which are transcendental. Uh, he used some uh, complicated sentence, but uh, he did not uh, say uh, these numbers are not algebraic. It was not so clear what, what is a transcendental number. So it, it took a long time, uh, and it was only during the 19th century that uh, the definition of an algebraic number and the transcendental number was made very clear. So uh, maybe we can uh, start with irrationality. As you know, the irrationality problems uh, started with the fact that the square root of two is not a rational number. This is something which was studied uh, by the Greek mathematician by uh, Platon, Theodorus of Cyrene, Hippasus of Metapontum. Uh, this was around 500 uh, before Christus. And uh, it was a little bit earlier that uh, this uh, kind of uh, consideration was uh, done in the Sulva Sutras in India. Uh, the fact that uh, square root of two is an irrational number is uh, 
the basic, uh, one of the basic elements of uh, algebraic number theory. And uh, the, the square root of two is an algebraic number because it's a root of the polynomial x squared minus two. And uh, one uh, natural question, I mentioned the fact that uh, uh, we know when, whether a number is irrational if and only if the decimal expansion is uh, ultimately periodic or the binary expansion. So uh, a natural question is to ask what can be said on the decimal expansion of uh, square root of two. In particular, it was a question asked by Emile Borel. He wrote two papers, one in 1905 and one in 1950. In the paper of 1950, he asked what can be said on the decimal expansion or the binary expansion of an algebraic irrational number and especially square root of two. And this is a quite interesting question on which we know very few things. We have almost no information on the decimal expansion of an irrational algebraic number like square root of two. For example, you choose one digit between uh, zero and nine, and you ask whether this particular digit will occur infinitely often in the decimal expansion of square root of two. And the answer is that we do not know. The conjecture is that yes, this digit occurs infinitely often. But what is worse is that uh, if you replace the basis 10 by any basis, if you replace the irrational algebraic number square root of two by any algebraic number, irrational algebraic number, we do not have the answer. A apart from trivial cases, if you take uh, the binary expansion, we know that uh, if the number is irrational, each digit uh, occurs infinitely often. But apart from that, we know almost nothing. There was a very interesting uh, result which was obtained rather recently in uh, 2005 by Adamsevsky and Bujo. They proved that uh, the uh, digits, binary digits or decimal digits of an algebraic irrational number cannot be produced by a fin finite automaton. This is a first step. I will not define the, the word, but uh, it's a first step. And uh, it means that uh, we are starting to get some information on this problem. So we can hope that uh, this will develop and uh, we may finally give an answer to the conjecture of Borel. The conjecture of Borel is that if you start from an algebraic irrational number and a basis, if you look at the expansion of this irrational algebraic number in this basis, so you have a sequence of digits. This sequence of digits behaves like almost all sequences of digits in the following sense. If you take any sequence of uh, k digits, the frequency of occurrence of this frequency in the expansion of the given number will be just uh, the, the one for all, almost all, all numbers, which means it will be one over b to the k, which is the, the expected uh, frequency. So this is the conjecture of Borel, and we are very far from, from this kind of problem. Nevertheless, the partial results that are known depend on methods which are very closely related with the method of transcendental numbers, which are the method of uh, Diophantine approximation. So I speak of irrationality, but it's closely related with the uh, transcendence. So, uh, I spoke of algebraic numbers, but we are interested now in transcendental numbers. And uh, the proof that some numbers, which we know now are transcendental, the proof that they are irrational, which was the first step, took a very long time. Of course, one of the most famous uh, uh, given number is the number pi. Uh, for the number pi, it was uh, Archimedes who studied the expansion, decimal expansion of pi by using what we call now cyclotomy, which means to divide uh, the circle and to look at a regular polygon with uh, many sides. So uh, what uh, was done by, uh, uh, for, for pi by uh, 
uh, Archimedes was to use the regular polygon of 96 sides. And uh, yesterday it was pointed out to me by uh, Rahim Zahari Nandi, that uh, you may know, that uh, 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 it was uh, done by uh, Kashani in uh, 1424 uh, using a, poly a regular polygon of uh, a number of sites, which is 2 power 28, and he was able to uh, compute 16 digits of the number pi. So uh, at that time, it was uh, conjectured that uh, the number pi is an irrational number. In fact, this uh, suggestion comes in the work of uh, Aryabhata in 476 and uh, Nick Lakanta Sumayaji in 1444. And this is uh, a question, the irrationality of pi, which uh, was not maybe phrased in a, in a way that, uh, a regular, uh, rigorous way that we know today, but it was something which was expected. And it is only in 1761, that uh, Lambert, the French mathematician, so we are still on the right uh, place, you can see it. So Lambert uh, proved the irrationality of pi. This proof is quite interesting. He starts by saying that the number pi has some well-known approximation. And he says, uh, these are only approximation. And if the number pi was a rational number, then there is no reason for which the numerator and denominator would, would be huge. And uh, uh, we know that uh, if it is a rational number, the, the number, the numerator and denominators are huge. But then he says, this is not uh, using this kind of argument that I will convince the people who are trying to solve the problem of squaring the circle, to draw a circle and a square which have the same area. And it was known that it was connected with the irrationality of pi, even if it was not so uh, clear, uh, the, the connection was not uh, quite obvious, but people knew that uh, there was some connection. Of course, if pi is a rational number, you can solve the squaring the circle very easily. But the converse is true. This was done by Van Sel uh, uh, much later. And so uh, Lambert starts with this argument and he says, uh, the people who are trying to square the circle need a, a very precise argument. And then he starts giving a very complete proof. Some people say that the proof was not complete. In fact, uh, the, the proof is very well written. He, he explains what he's doing. And uh, at the end, he gets the conclusion that the number pi is an irrational number. For the number e, uh, it, it was done essentially by Euler that the number e is an irrational number, even if he did not phrase it in this way, because Euler gave the continued fraction, the regular continued fraction expansion of e, and it is quasi-periodic, but it is infinite, and therefore the number e is an irrational number. So these are the two early results of irrationality of numbers for which we know now that uh, they are transcendental. So maybe now I can uh, switch to the topic of the talk, which is transcendental numbers. The first uh, example of a transcendental number was given by Liouville in 1844. And it is quite interesting that uh, at that time, the existence of transcendental numbers was not established. So, uh, so we, we can say like this, uh, the set of transcendental numbers is not empty. But it is much better than that. What uh, Liouville did was to give some concrete example of transcendental numbers. The difficulty is that if you have a number, you want to prove that it is transcendental. A priori, what you need to prove is that whenever you take a polynomial with rational coefficients, which is not zero, this polynomial will not vanish at the given point. And so you, you need to consider all, all the polynomials, and uh, it's not so easy to see how to do that. 
the idea of Liouville is to prove the property of algebraic numbers. And after that, to construct some numbers which do not have this property. And what is the property of algebraic numbers? Uh, so if alpha is a root of a polynomial P in Q of X, P is not the zero polynomial. The polynomial has a degree B, say. Then what uh, Liouville proved is that alpha cannot be well approximated by uh, rational numbers. So there exists a constant C, which depends on alpha, such that for all rational numbers P of Q, we have alpha minus P of Q written than C of alpha divided by Q of G. Maybe I should add the condition that P of Q is different from alpha. Otherwise, this would be zero. So this is the uh, theorem that uh, Liouville proves for algebraic numbers. So when I, I say that alpha is the root of a polynomial which is non-zero, it means that uh, alpha is algebraic. So for all algebraic numbers, we have a low bound between alpha and P of Q whenever P of Q is a rational number different from alpha. This is quite clever. It's not so difficult. Uh, now that we understand very well the situation, we consider that this is a, a, a very easy result. The idea of the proof is very uh, uh, useful, and we use it in the most uh, transcendence proof. The idea of the proof, I, I can tell you in a few words, is just to say uh, you look at, uh, you assume that alpha minus p over q is small, and you look at the number p over q. So you take this polynomial, you replace alpha by p over q, you multiply by q power d, and you see that you have an integer. And the property which is used is that non-zero integer has an absolute value at least one. And so the proof is quite elementary, and it gives an explicit value for c of alpha. You can write c, c of alpha very explicitly. The drawback is that uh, the proof gives uh, an explicit low bound, but it works if you want to have uh, to construct transcendental numbers. You will get transcendental numbers only uh, if you construct them uh, in such a way that they do not satisfy Liouville inequality. And so this is the first step, which is very important. It's only after Liouville that the other proofs of the existence of infinitely many transcendental numbers were, were given, uh, for example, by Cantor, who showed that uh, almost uh, all uh, complex numbers are transcendental, uh, just because the algebraic numbers are countable and the real or complex numbers are not countable. But uh, uh, this uh, result, which is the first uh, result on transcendental number theory, uh, is a useful tool, but it does not solve the main problem, which is to prove the transcendence of given numbers. So the next step after Liouville was done by Hermit in 1873. Or 72. I have written the 1873. And what Hermit proved is that the basis of the exponential E is a transcendental number. The fact that E is an irrational number, I told you that it was proved by uh, Euler using continued fraction. There are other proofs of the irrationality of E, which are much easier. Uh, one of them is due to Fourier, and it may have the start from the result of a Liouville. But anyway, it is just by writing that E is the sum of one of the n factorial, and using the same kind of argument as Liouville. But the fact that E 
is a transcendental number is much deeper. I, I have studied uh, this paper by Hermit, uh, which is in French, and uh, I like this paper very much. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, Hermit starts by uh, explaining that uh, in, in uh, Diophantan approximation, we have studied the approximation of a single number, alpha minus p over q, but there are also some results on the approximation of uh, simultaneous approximation of several numbers, real numbers, say, if we approximate by rational numbers. And he said, I would like to study something similar, not for numbers, but for functions, like the exponential function. And he explained the analogy between Diophantine approximation of numbers and the analytic approximation of expon the exponential function. What is interesting is that uh, uh, in the review of the work by uh, Hermit, uh, it was in the Yarbour, the one who wrote the review uh, looked, uh, read the introduction, and he said that uh, Hermit explained the connection between the approximation of numbers and the functions. And uh, uh, he did not see that uh, in the middle of the paper, Hermit explained that he has proved that E is a transcendental number. I like the way that Hermit uh, explains it because he starts by explaining his method. And at one point, he says, I have a determinant and uh, there is no reason for which the determinant uh, should vanish. And then he continues by assuming that the determinant is not zero. And then a little bit later, he says, but uh, we have to come back and give a very rigorous uh, argument. When I read that for the first time, I thought, what, what does he mean? And then I saw that uh, before he said, uh, there is no reason for which the determinant would vanish, but uh, he did not prove that it does not vanish. And uh, he was not able to prove that it does not vanish. So what he does is to take a very long detour and it's uh, very tricky and very clever. But at the end, he has a full proof that uh, E is a transcendental number. After he proved that, uh, Hermit uh, uh, wrote to some colleagues that, uh, of course, uh, the problem of the transcendence of pi was open at that time, but he said that uh, he does not uh, expect his method will work. And he said, if uh, some other people uh, want to expand my method and get the, the transcendence of pi, I wish them good luck, but it will be difficult. And so uh, it was clear that Hermit wanted to solve the problem of the transcendence of pi, because it was known by the work of Van Sell a few years before that uh, this would solve the problem of squaring the circle. And it, it turned out that uh, it was not uh, so long after that the Lindemann found a proof in 1882 that the number pi is a transcendental number. And in fact, uh, what uh, came out of the method of uh, Hermit and Lindemann is a theorem which contains both results. And uh, this theorem is called the theorem of uh, Hermit-Lindemann. And it's really the method that uh, both uh, used which uh, yield this uh, result, which is the following. So the theorem of Hermit-Lindemann is that if you take alpha, an algebraic number, which is different from zero, then exponential of alpha is transcendental. If you take alpha equal one, you have E. If you take alpha equal I pi, this number is minus one, which is not transcendental, and therefore I pi is not algebraic, and therefore pi is a transcendental number. This was more or less the state of the art in 1900. There were some variant of the proof of uh, Hermit and Lindemann, but in terms of uh, theorems, the, the, there was not a very great achievement at the end of the 19th century. And in 1900, Hilbert 
gave uh, the famous uh, talk at the International Congress of Paris with uh, 23 problems. And uh, the seventh problem which uh, was asked by Hilbert. Well, he starts with the problem of the geometry with the triangle and uh, with uh, looking at the side. But uh, after that, he explained that the, the problem which uh, raises is to prove that the number exponential of pi is transcendental. So this is the first uh, question he asks. The next question he asks is, is it true that two power square root of two is a transcendental number? And then he asks a more general question. And the more general question is alpha to the beta, is it a transcendental number? And this contains the two uh, previous uh, questions, but we have to say what are alpha and beta. Alpha and beta are algebraic numbers. Next, we have to assume that beta is irrational because if you take alpha to a rational exponent, it will be algebraic. So beta is irrational. But there is something else to be said. What, what is alpha to the beta? By definition, it is the exponential of beta log alpha. But uh, alpha is a complex number, algebraic. And if you speak of log alpha, you first have to assume that alpha is non-zero. And then you have to say what is log alpha. Uh, you have infinitely many choices. You can add a, a two pi i. In fact, the only assumption that you need on log alpha, you choose any logarithm of alpha, provided that you do, do not choose zero. So the right condition is log alpha different from zero. And so this is the seventh problem of uh, Hilbert. Of course, if you take uh, uh, beta equal uh, square root of two and alpha equal two, you get two power square root of two. But uh, if you want to get uh, exponential of pi, of course, you do not take alpha equal e and beta equal pi. You take uh, alpha equal minus one or one, you can take alpha equal one if you like, and you take log alpha equal two pi i. So alpha equal one is allowed. Uh, we are not allowed to take log alpha equal zero, but two pi i is allowed. And when you look at uh, what is, uh, uh, and the, the i, you take uh, the, the beta, you take beta equal i. Or if you prefer, you, you take a, a two, a one over two i. And like this, beta log alpha is pi, and uh, you get exponential of pi. So this was the seventh problem of Hilbert. And uh, Hilbert gave a lecture in Göttingen. Uh, in his lecture, uh, Hilbert said that uh, there are three main problems in uh, number theory. Uh, he mentioned the problem of the uh, Riemann hypothesis. Next, he mentioned the Fermat's La theorem. And the third one, he mentioned the transcendence of two power square root of two. And he said uh, that uh, there had been some, at that time, it was in 1916, something like this, there had been some progress on uh, the uh, Riemann hypothesis. And he said, uh, we may expect that the solution will come rather soon. For uh, the problem of Fermat, Fermat's last theorem, he said, uh, this will take much more time, but maybe the youngest in the audience will see the, the solution. But for two to the square root of two, he said, no, this is the most difficult of the three problems, and nobody here will uh, see the solution. In this audience, uh, there was Siegel. And uh, Ziegel saw the solution of two to the square root of two, and in fact, he contributed to, to, to this solution. So Ziegel 
uh, is the next uh, name that I want to mention on this uh, historical survey. In 1929, he wrote a very important paper in two parts. One part is on transcendental numbers, and the second part is on the theorem of uh, Siegel on the integer points on curse of uh, genus at least one, where the result is that the set of uh, rational of uh, integers, integer points, is a finite set. And uh, it's a paper in two parts, and uh, the common feature to the two parts is that uh, he uses what he calls what, what is called the Dirichlet box principle, which is a lemma which was initially due to two-way, Axel two-way. And in fact, Ziegel introduced this uh, auxiliary lemma, which is the Dirichlet box principle in transcendental number theory. And it turned out that uh, this auxiliary lemma had a very important uh, consequence in, in the in the subject. So I will explain uh, uh, what were the progress initially on the problem of uh, Hilbert by uh, going back to Weierstrass. who looked at the theorem of uh, Helmick Hindemann. I recall that it said that uh, if alpha is an algebraic number different from zero, then exponential of alpha is transcendental. So this is Helmick Hindemann. And Weierstrass asks, uh, is, is there some general result that if you take a function which is transcendental, which is not a polynomial, a non type function, then most often at an algebraic point, it will take a transcendental value. Excuse me, alpha is in Q1. If alpha is algebraic, exponential of alpha is transcendental. But Weierstrass very rapidly found that uh, there was no such statement. We can, he, he constructed some uh, functions which takes uh, uh, algebraic values at all algebraic points. So, and uh, so th there is no general result like uh, Weierstrass was uh, expecting. Of course, now we have some information on this problem. And uh, what we do is that we do not take uh, an arbitrary function. We take some specific function, in particular function satisfying some differential equations. But what is interesting is that uh, because there is no general result like Weierstrass was asking for, we have to restrict. We can restrict the function, but we can restrict the points. And instead of looking at uh, algebraic values at algebraic points, we can start by the beginning to look at uh, integer values of integer functions uh, at integer point. And this is the subject of uh, integer values on functions. It's a topic which was started by Polya, who proved that the function 2 to the z, so this is 2, this is z, 2 to the z is the smallest entire function which takes integer values at all points in n. So it maps n to z. If z is a non-negative integer, 2 to the z is an integer. But this is the smallest function, which is analytic everywhere in C, and which is not a polynomial. It does not seem to be really connected with the transcendental number theory. What is important is that uh, Polya was in 1914. In 1929, they found, generalized this result, in a way which uh, may look like an exercise, instead of taking n and z, you look at z of i. Uh, is it OK here? At the function which maps z of i to z of i. Uh, uh, I. Instead of I, seeing. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to mention the z can be seen, at, but barely. OK. Like this, it's better. Let me see. 
Well, that's very easy to see. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So Gilpon proved that a function which maps z of i to z of i grows at least like exponential a constant times z squared. So it's of order two. Here it's of order one, and here it's of order two. Uh, if you take the sigma function of Weierstrass, it satisfies it, it maps z of i to zero. So it's uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt again. The lower line e to the c z squared, the e is obscured. Uh, e is the basis of the exponential. Yeah, no, no, it is. Uh, it cannot be seen from the camera. Ah, okay. <laughs> sorry. Yes, of course I. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, I didn't. Yes. yes, yes, that's good. Thanks. Okay. I understand the word. The, the z squared was visible, but the e was not. <laughs> okay, so uh, it, it looks like an easy ex ex exercise after the work of Polya. The proof is essentially the same, but the, the connection with the problem of uh, uh, of uh, Hilbert is that if you look at the number exponential of pi and uh, assume that exponential of pi is an integer. Then, uh, whenever you take exponential of pi z square, if you replace z by an integer, you will have an element in, in z of i, and uh, uh, exponential pi z, excuse me, pi z. If you replace z by an element of z of i, exponential of pi z will be in z of i. And just by expanding the method, instead of uh, integer, you can assume that exponential of pi is rational. And in fact, what uh, Gelfond was able to do in 1929 is to prove that exponential of pi is transcendental. So this was really the first step towards the solution of Hilbert's problem. And in 1934, Gelfond and Schneider the full conjecture on alpha to the beta. So they, they solved completely the problem of uh, Hilbert. I see that time is passing very fast and <laughs> I am at the beginning of the story of the history of transcendental numbers. So maybe I should uh, go a little bit faster. Uh, Gelfond uh, continued his work and Schneider also, but both in some di different direction. Schneider extended his work to study elliptic functions, abelian varieties and abelian functions. And uh, Gelfond studied algebraic independence. And so it goes in quite different direction, but uh, after some time, the two directions merge. I should mention the work of Baker in 1968 who proved the linear independence of logarithm of algebraic numbers. So what Baker proved is that uh, if you take log alpha one, log alpha n, which are linearly independent of a q, then they are linearly independent of uh, the feed of algebraic numbers, even with one. It's a nice result. It's, it's a conjecture of Gelfond, and uh, it has a lot of consequences. If you just take log alpha, to say that it is Q linearly independent means that it is not zero. To say that one log alpha are linearly independent of a Q means that log alpha is transcendental. So if, if you take just n equal one, you have the hermic indeman theorem. If you take log alpha one, log alpha two, you say that if the quotient is irrational, then it is a transcendental number. And this is the theorem of Gelfond Schneider. So it contains uh, the results of uh, which were previously known on the exponential function, as long as the linear independence is concerned. For the algebraic independence, we know very few things. And this is what uh, I will start as the first conjecture. And this is the main conjecture in transcendental number theory. It is not the most general one, but it is one which would have tremendous consequences. And uh, I can say that this is the one on which I have spent uh, most of my time in research. 
but uh, it is not uh, yet uh, known. The conjecture is that under this assumption, the numbers log alpha one, log alpha n are algebraically independent. Which means that a polynomial, non zero polynomial in log alpha one, log alpha n will not vanish uh, at, at this point. Uh, algebraic independent, uh, here I say whether it's of Q of Q bar, but for algebraic independence, it does not matter. You take a polynomial either with algebraic or rational coefficients, it will not uh, vanish at this point. This is really uh, the main uh, open problem in this domain. We know almost nothing on that. Nevertheless, there has been some results of uh, algebraic independence recently. In particular, it was proved in 1976 by Shumersky that the numbers pi and gamma of 1, 4 are algebraically independent. And it was proved in 1996 by Mr. Yenko that the number pi, exponential of pi, gamma of 1, 4, are algebraically independent. These are, these are quite remarkable results. And uh, when uh, Mr. Yenko proved this result, I mentioned that this to a colleague, and when I told him this result, he was laughing. He said, why does it take these numbers, this very peculiar number, and why not some other numbers? And the answer is that uh, uh, we know very few things about algebraic independence, and the proof works with these three numbers. It, it works also with gamma of one over three, but it does not work with other, other numbers like gamma of one over five. So uh, we have very few results in this uh, domain, and uh, this is really quite an achievement. I would like to give some uh, example of, of uh, results which are related with the work of Nesterienko, and uh, so uh, I will try to share my screen. Uh, okay, so I prepare something. Do you see my screen now? Yes, it's very visible. Uh, okay, good. So uh, I rephrase the result of Nesterienko using the Eisenstein series, which are E2, E4, and E6. These are the classical notation for the Eisenstein series. In the notation of Ramanujan, uh, E2 is P, uh, E4 is Q, and E6 is R. And the result of Nesterienko is that if you take a complex number Q, in the unit disk, which is not zero, at least three of the four numbers Q, P of Q, Q of Q, and R of Q are algebraically independent. So this is a very beautiful result, and uh, you get some, uh, ex some, some examples when uh, you take some specific values for the, for the number Q. And so uh, I would like to say a few words on some related problems uh, using some function which was introduced by Emil Grosswald in 1976. He introduced uh, the function which is the sum for m and n, which are positive integers, uh, n to the minus k exponential 2 i pi m n z. So this function f can be also written as the sum of sigma minus k of n exponential 2 i pi n z. What is sigma minus k? I define the sigma t of n as the sum of d to the t. So this is the sum of the divisors of d of n with the exponent t. So this is sigma minus k. And it turns out that the fk of z, if you uh, work a little bit on this uh, function, you will find that it is minus zeta of k minus the sum of n to the k exponential 2 i pi nz minus 1. And therefore, uh, you deduce, uh, for example, you have this uh, 
uh, result here, zeta of three plus uh, twice this sum is seven pi to the cube divided by 180. The right-hand side is a transcendental number because pi is transcendental. And therefore, one at least of the two numbers, zeta of 4k plus three and this sum is transcendental. Uh, in transcendental number theory, we have many results of this uh, shape. Uh, we have many numbers and we say at least one of them is transcendental or at least two of them are algebraically independent. So we very often have some partial results uh, without uh, having the full uh, answer. We expect that both numbers are transcendental. This is related with the Eichler integrals. Uh, I write again the Eisenstein series, which are not exactly the one uh, before. Uh, I, I find that there is a mistake. I, I show only four uh, slides and I, make, I made a mistake, a misprint. This is gamma k plus the sum. It's not times, it is plus here. The plus is missing. So gamma k is a constant term of this uh, Eisenstein series, which means that uh, it is the previous one uh, with some normalization, which is a change. So apart from this uh, constant, uh, it is. So we, we remove the constant term to this uh, Eisenstein series, and uh, we find that the function which I introduced before of uh, Grosswald is given by this integral. And the result of uh, Gunn, Murti, and Rat is that if k is a non-negative integer, with at most 2k plus 5 exception, the number which is here is a transcendental for every algebraic number alpha in the upper half plane. So every algebraic number apart from at most 2k plus 5 exception. So this is a result which was uh, published uh, in 2011 by uh, Purus Tamrat, Ram Murti, and uh, Shaoli Gunn. So I wanted to give uh, this example because uh, it may be interesting for some people who attend this talk. And now I come back to, to the blackboard. So I think I have uh, still a few minutes. Can you tell me how long uh, you expect me to, uh, to speak? Yes, um, you can take as many as 10 minutes if you like, but okay. this being said, no one is ever upset at a speaker who uh, takes a bit less. <laughs> so it's oh, it oh, what, it what is appropriate for, for you. I, I wish to have uh, enough time for, for questions. Yes. In fact, be before I continue, are, are there some questions? These questions are welcome and you can unmute yourself. To yes, I, I look at the chat, but uh, Ah, yes, uh, I, I see there are some advice for people who attend. In, in fact, uh, yes, to enlarge the view, it, uh, it's worth to do. Okay, so uh, in this case, I will uh, continue the, to, to, to describe the situation. Uh, in fact, uh, what I would like to do uh, to complete this survey is uh, to uh, give some uh, conjectures on uh, transcendental number theory. I told you that uh, one of the main conjectures is the one which is written here. So we take, uh, so I remove that. Uh, you, you see that we know something about uh, linear independence, but about algebraic independence, we do not know. So the conjecture is this one. We have logarithm of algebraic numbers, <coughs> then, if they are linearly independent of a Q, so they do not satisfy linear relations, then the numbers log alpha one, log alpha two should be algebraically independent. This is a special case of the so-called Chanuel's conjecture. Chanuel's conjecture is the following result. We take x1 and xn, which are complex numbers, linearly independent of a q. The conclusion is that among the numbers uh, x and exponential of x, at least n of them are algebraically independent. We can phrase it like this the transcendence degree of a q of the field Q of X1, Xn, exponential X1, exponential Xn is at least N.
So this means that among these two n numbers, always at least n of them are algebraically independent. So let me make a few uh, remarks on this conjecture. Of course, it, it is open because even this special case is open. If you take the xi equal log alpha i, the assumption is that the xi are linearly independent of the q, which was the assumption for the conjecture here. But you see that the exponential of xi are alpha i, which are algebraic. So they do not contribute to the transcendence degree. So the case xi equal log alpha i is just the conjecture of algebraic independence of logarithm of algebraic numbers. The second example is if you take uh, the xi which are algebraic, let me say beta i, just to, to change the Greek letter, I will not go to Omicron, I will just go to alpha and beta. So uh, xi equal beta i, the statement of Chanuet conjecture is that if beta 1, beta n are linearly independent of q and are algebraic numbers, then the exponential are algebraically independent. This is almost the only case where Chanuet's conjecture is known. And this is the so called Lindemann Weierstrass theorem. We state that uh, if beta one, beta n are algebraic numbers linearly independent of the Q, then exponential beta one, exponential beta n are algebraically independent. Why is it possible to prove such a, a result? It is because if you look at the polynomial in exponential beta one, beta n, you have a linear combination of exponential because of the functional equation of the exponential function. In fact, the result of Lindemann and Weierstrass is equivalent to say that, uh, so I say that I will use alpha and beta, I will go to gamma. So the, this theorem can be stated in an equivalent way as follows. If we have gamma one, gamma n, which are algebraic numbers and pairwise distinct, then exponential gamma one, exponential gamma n are linearly independent. you before, when I say algebraically independent, I do not need to say whether it's the Q or the Q bar. Uh, it is the same. The transcendent degree does not change if you take Q or Q bar. If you take a linearly independent, it depends whether you take Q or Q bar. But because of the equivalence which is here, to say that these numbers are linearly independent of the Q or of the Q bar is equivalent. The two statements are equivalent. And so uh, the result of lindemann weierstrass is a result of linear independence, even if it uh, stays, say that uh, they are algebraically independent. And on linear independence, we know more than on the uh, algebraic independence. Uh, if you take uh, any conjecture dealing with uh, uh, transcendental numbers and the exponential function or logarithm function, uh, you will deduce the result from Chanuel's conjecture. For example, from Chanuel's conjecture, you deduce that the number pi e, e to the pi, and so on, are algebraically independent. But uh, we know almost nothing for that. We know that e and e to the pi are algebraically independent. This is a part of the result of, uh, uh, of uh, Nesterienko. Uh, it's, uh, 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 pi and e to the pi. But uh, what is interesting is that uh, we know the proof of this result only by using modular functions and uh, going to the gamma of one fourth, 
We know that among pi e to the pi and gamma of n4, the three are algebraically independent, but we do not know a direct proof for the transcendence of pi and e to the pi. So this is a bit frustrating that we know so few things. Chanuel's conjecture is not the most general one. There are some more general conjectures, which are due to uh, Grotenli. This is the so-called conjecture. Which deals with the periods of, uh, say, abelian functions. And uh, if you want a conjecture, which contains both Chanuel's conjecture and Grotendieck period conjecture. This was done by Yves André using motifs. So Yves André has a very general conjecture dealing with motifs, which contains Chanuel's conjecture and Grotendieck period conjecture. Well, it was the philosophy of uh, Grotendieck that if you want to solve the particular problem, it's good to generalize it and to solve the general problem. So maybe the solution of Chanel's conjecture will work, will, will come from uh, using motifs. This is something which uh, could be expected. I would like to uh, mention one more uh, problem, which is related with the work of uh, uh, Konsevich and Zagier, which is the conjecture of period. There has a paper on periods, which was published in 2000, and uh, they define what are periods, and they get some general conjecture on uh, these uh, numbers, uh, which would uh, give rise to uh, the, uh, the Diophantine results, like uh, to know whether a number is transcendental or, or is not transcendental. And uh, in this connection, I would like to mention the, the conjecture on the multiple Zeta values, few things are known on uh, the Riemann Zeta function. It is known that this Zeta of three is irrational. This is a work by Pateri. We do not know whether it is transcendental. We do not know whether Zeta of five, for example, is irrational. And uh, there are some conjectures on the algebraic independence of uh, zeta values. And what is expected is that uh, if you take the numbers pi, zeta of three, zeta of pi, and zeta of two and plus one, uh, the conjecture is that they are algebraically independent. And th there is some work uh, dealing with this kind of problem, uh, which was done by uh, Francis Brown recently. Uh, dealing with uh, multiple zeta values. And uh, this is a, a work which uh, involves the motifs, uh, like uh, in the work of Yves André. And, Maybe this is the way that uh, transcendental number theory will develop in the near future. And so it, it was a bit uh, fast at the end because I found that uh, I had no much time. But uh, this is a, an overview which was uh, very sketchy, of course. But there, there are so many things to, to say that uh, I needed to make a choice. So I welcome the question now. So thank you for attending my talk. Thank you very much. Um, we can clap or uh, indicate on the chat something. So uh, the floor is open for questions. Yes. So, uh, yes. Thank, th thanks. Thanks a lot for this talk, uh, Professor Walshman. I'm curious, I have a question. I'm not sure how valid is it. So, so if we take like a transcendental number and start taking its integer powers, like, like let's say we take pi and then we take pi, pi squared, pi cube and so on. 
And we, we, we study this space that is generated by uh, one pi pi square pi cube and like all, all rational linear combination. I mean, do we have an understanding? I mean, first of all, is this set an interesting set? Do we have an understanding of this set? Uh, so you, you, you take, in, in fact, it is a field generated by uh, phi, uh, for example, by pi, q of pi. Uh, from an algebraic point of view, this field behaves like uh, any field. This is what uh, is uh, in, in the remark of uh, Shimura that uh, if you have a number which is transcendental, then the, the field Q of pi, for example, is, is always the same. So from if you take just an, the, the point of view of uh, uh, algebraic uh, algebra, then uh, there is uh, it's not so much interesting. But uh, uh, you can ask, uh, of course, it is dense, even if you just take a linear combination of one and pi, uh, we, which, which kind of uh, property would you ask for, for, for this field? Uh, what does it generate? Do you know if a number is written as a linear combination? This is what the, I mean. So which field, do we have some surprising results or? Okay, so, uh, very recently, I got some exchange of uh, messages with a colleague who uh, published a paper in the archive, which is on, on uh, transcendental groups. Uh, so uh, his, his name is uh, Sydney. Uh, his first name is Sydney. I forgot his name. He's from Australia and uh, uh, what, what he studied is uh, some groups which have the property that uh, all the non-zero elements, it's a, a, a subgroup of C, all the non-zero elements are transcendental. And so uh, this is the case if you take uh, the linear, in, in fact, the field that you consider here, uh, if you take, uh, you have, if you take the field, you have the, the constant which, which occur, the, the field generated of a Q. But if you take the linear combination, uh, ah yes, you, you again have the constant. But so you, you have su such property that the, uh, apart from the constant, the, the other elements will be transcendental. But uh, yes, okay. So if you take the linear combination of uh, pi, pi square, pi cube, and so on, uh, apart from zero, all the elements are transcendental numbers. So this is the kind of uh, property that you have. But you see, this kind of property will be true if you replace pi by any transcendental number. So uh, if, if you want to ask some specific property of pi, and uh, for example, uh, so, some property which would not be shared by the number e, uh, I, I not find immediately some, uh, some good answer. Uh, that that would, may be interesting to, to prove that e and pi are algebraically independent, which is uh, one of the intriguing open problems. Uh, professor, I have a question uh, uh, regarding uh, one of the results. So we know that uh, e to the power pi is transcendental. Yes. I don't know if this is true, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, in one of the papers, I've read that pi to the e is still unknown of ah, yes. state, yes. of whether it is. I like this question. <laughs> yes. So uh, it, it is known that e to the pi is transcendental, and nothing is known about pi to the e. So this is transcendental, but this one, we do not even know that it is an irrational number, pi to the e. And th this may look at the first glance a little bit surprising that uh, we know something here and not there. But uh, in the literature, you find a lot of uh, formulae which comes from analysis where exponential of pi occurs. Uh, of course, the easiest uh, such formula is the exponential of pi to the power e, which is minus one. And it's really exponential of pi which comes into the picture. And uh, also, uh, this is how we prove that exponential of pi is a transcendental number. For pi to the e, I, I, 
I did not see any formula occurring coming from uh, analysis, some integrals or something like this, which uh, would involve pi to the e. So pi to the e is not a constant which is as natural as, uh, as pi. Uh, by the way, uh, if you want to know what is expected for pi to the e, you can use Chanuel's conjecture, and Chanuel's conjecture will tell you that pi to the e is a transcendental number. So if Chanuel's conjecture is true, then you deduce the transcendence of pi to the e, and I can tell you how you start the proof. You, you are interested in pi to the e. So what is pi to the e? It is exponential e log pi. So you have to take e, and you have to take log pi. And then you will have uh, pi to the e. So you, you will take the product of uh, e and log pi. So this will be your x. But then uh, you, you need to use that uh, you start with e and not with an, another number. So you, you take one here. And then you have to use that uh, this is pi, this is not uh, any number. So you, you will take uh, i pi. And you take this as your x. Of course, you face the problem that you do not know whether they are linearly independent. Just forget that and look at the exponential. The exponential of these numbers are e. So I, I do not put e here. It will be in the second row. The exponential is e. This is i. This is pi to the e. And this is minus 1. These are the exponential. Now, what uh, does uh, Chanuel's conjecture tell you? It tells you that uh, if you look at uh, these uh, uh, four numbers, uh, there are uh, eight numbers, four of them are algebraically independent. Which one are algebraically independent? You have e, you have pi, you have log pi, and you have uh, pi to the e, and, uh, and that's all. all. All the others are in the field. So Chanuel's conjecture will tell you that these four numbers are algebraically independent, provided that the numbers here are linearly independent of a Q. So you are reduced, you, you will get the transcendence of pi to the e, provided that these four numbers are linearly independent. And so you write what it means that they are linearly independent of a Q. Of course, i pi does not come into the picture. And uh, it just means that uh, if you have i plus b log pi plus c uh, e log pi, this will be different from zero. How can you prove that? We have no idea how to prove it, but we say that we use Chanuel's conjecture, so we can use Chanuel's conjecture. And then uh, using Chanuel's conjecture, we deduce that uh, these numbers should be linearly independent. Okay, this is a sketch of proof. This is the first step. Thank you, Professor. I mean, even e plus pi, it's not non rational, yes? I mean, there's not we, the, yes. yeah, I mean, e plus pi, we do not know whether it's rational or not. But so, uh, if we assume Chanuel's conjecture, then, then we, we know everything. Mm -hmm. How convincing are the heuristic arguments for Chanuel's conjecture? Uh, there, there are some analogues. Instead of taking numbers, we can take power series, and then the, the result is known. So this is one of the heuristic argument, which is in favor of uh, Chanuel's conjecture. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it. Uh, we we really do not expect that there would be a, a counter example. It would be extremely surprising. Of course, maybe it would be more rich if the uh, situation is more complicated than expected. But uh, uh, well, it, it contains so so many things which fit together perfectly that uh, it's a kind of a heuristic mm -hmm. argument. Mm -hmm. It's a well wishing. <laughs> Are there some more questions?
maybe I'll ask one last question. You mentioned about, uh, you know, irrationality of Zeta 5 not being known. Um, but I seem to remember there are statements about if you take enough Zeta values or maybe multiple Zeta values, you have at least a certain lower bound for how many are Q linearly independent. Yes. How related is that to uh, proving questions about transcendence? Uh, okay, so it's it's uh, first step. Before proving transcendence, we want to prove irrationality. Mm -hmm. And then uh, among the zeta values, we expect that uh, all these numbers are irrational. And so this is the first step. Mm -hmm. uh, for this first step, uh, what was done by Ball and Rivoal was to prove that uh, many of uh, these numbers, if you take, uh, well, if you take uh, these numbers, then uh, the uh, space generated over Q by these numbers has a dimension which is at least the logarithm in basis two of N, which is far from what is expected, but it's a first step. Very recently, it was proved by uh, Stephen Fischler that uh, uh, th there was some progress in between, but uh, the most recent result is, is uh, a result uh, giving a low bound for the number of uh, algebraic numbers in this set, uh, which is uh, almost uh, n. If we had n, so the, the goal is to say that these numbers are linearly independent of a q. Uh, this would be a really uh, a very great achievement. And instead of that, we have a low bound for the space, which is uh, no, no, it's not n, but it's uh, rather close to n. It's much closer than it, it used to be in the previous results. Mm. After that, once, if, if, we, if we are able to handle suitably the linear dependence relation between these numbers, which means to prove that there, there, there is no such relation, uh, the, the next step is to prove algebraic independence. And for that, we have to, to look at numbers z of s point z of s2, to look at products and polynomials in these numbers. But when you look at a product like this, it is, a, it is a, uh, well, the, the multiple zeta values have been introduced in such a way that they take care of this product. Yes. And a problem of linear independence of zeta values will give algebraic independence. Okay. There is a conjecture of uh, 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 Don Zaghi on the linear independence, on, on the dimension of the space, which is generated by multiple zeta values. And it was proved by Francis Brown that this conjecture on linear independence would yield the algebraic independence of these numbers here. And so if we are able to handle well the linear independence relations, then we may expect to have the solution of this problem, which is here. So this is why uh, to prove that among these numbers, some of them are transcendental is an important step towards the finite goal, which uh, we expect to, to see one, one day. Oh, thank you very much. Tomal, may I ask one, one more question? Sorry. Yes, please. Uh, so so I, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned it. So we, we have that this lower bound uh, for the error for irrationals. Like if you have an irrational numbers and I saw you wrote like irrationalized P over Q is greater or equals than c over q power alpha, so this uh, lower yes. bound. Do you have something similar for transcendental number, like uh, how ah. far they are from algebraic, from rationals? Do, can we like, uh, do we have similar? Uh... Okay, so uh, the, the result that you mentioned is the result of uh, Duville, and the yes. result of Duville give a low bound between alpha and algebraic number and p over q. Now, if instead of alpha, you take a transcendental number, and this was the idea of Duville, you can construct complex numbers or real numbers, real numbers because you approximate by rational numbers. You can construct real numbers which are approximated as well as you want by rational numbers, just by taking, for example, series which converge very fast. And so uh, these are the so-called Uville numbers, and they are transcendental. But uh, if you take a transcendental number, in general, you cannot give such a low bound if you do not specify which uh, transcendental number you take. 
However, if you take a number like pi, e, and so on, then there are such results. For e, the result is uh, almost, uh, is, is essentially the best possible because uh, we know the continuous fraction expansion of e. For pi, it is not as good as that. Uh, we know that pi minus p over q is greater than one over q to the, I don't remember exactly the exponent, but it was improved very, very recently by uh, Zudinin and his co-authors. And uh, it's something like five or six uh, instead of, of two, which is expected, two plus epsilon. Uh, for many numbers, uh, for gamma of one fourth, we have, uh, we know that it is irrational, it is transcendental, and we have an exponent which is uh, rather large, a few hundred. But uh, if you give a specific transcendental number, we expect that uh, the same inequality as Louisville is true with some exponent, which should be two plus epsilon. But if you do not specify which algebra, which transcendental number you, you get, you cannot uh, have a general result. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, uh, it's time to thank uh, Professor Waldschmidt again. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Great. So more applause, okay. I guess. <laughs> yes, it's hard over Zoom. I know what it's like. <laughs> okay, bye bye. And we hope to see you in person in Beirut. Uh, oh, I hope so. Yes. Time, not too far That's in the future. The people, yes, but you have to be there also, not in Bonn. <laughs> no, no. I, I have one more semester of leave. I should be uh, back in, in August. Ah, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so see you then. Thanks. So take, take care. care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.